Good day. Today, I take this opportunity to really simplify vitamin D and make it very easy to understand and take away all the myths and misunderstanding about vitamin D. And I'm gonna be talking about it and see, hopefully, this can help you in making decisions when to take vitamin D, how much vitamin D to take, and what is the truth and what is the myths and misunderstandings about vitamin D. So, the history of vitamin D is very interesting. We think that millions and millions of years ago, the earth was covered with water. So all the creatures, mainly fish, had buoyancy. So really, they did not need strong bones to stand up straight. And they had only cartilage that did not need calcification or calcium deposits to make it strong. And as history moved forward and these creatures moved forward to land and wanted to stand upright, there was a need for these cartilages, the soft cartilage, to become calcified. And if it becomes calcified, then it is strong enough for these creatures to stand up. And the only way at the time we thought that calcium would deposit in these soft cartilages and change them into hard bones was utilizing or making vitamin D from the sun because they are no longer in the water, but they are on, on land, sun exposure, calcium deposits in the bones. So these creatures became now upright, able to live on land, able to stand upright and move forward. And this is just a very interesting theory that we have no scientific basis for it, but it's just that I would like to share it with you. Now, in the turn of the 1900s, we realized after urbanization that there are children who live in high rises with narrow alleys. These children will acquire a disease called rickets. And if you see those pictures, this is from Glasgow. In the early 1900s, these children had clearly the evidence of rickets or the uh, deformity of their legs. Now, in adults, this disease is called osteomalacia, which is softening of the bones, and it's progressive, and it's fairly painful, and it is related to decalcification of the bones. This is a picture of an adult man who has also deformity of the bones, and you can see it is related to lack of calcium deposits in the bones, so the legs will look like this. Dr. McCullum, in 1921, he discovered that there was an anti-rickets substance that was present in fatty foods. And we know today that was called vitamin D. And there are vitamin Ds from D1 to D5, but what we use today in clinical medicine are vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. And these are the most important ones in uh, clinical medicine. And vitamin D actually is fairly rare in food. So the idea, this is myth number one, the idea, oh, I'm eating eggs, so I'm taking enough vitamin D, or I'm drinking fat-free milk, so I'm having enough vitamin D, is absolutely wrong because fat-free milk does not have vitamin D because vitamin D is dissolved in fat. Eggs have very little to minuscule to even negligible amount of vitamin D. Vitamin D is actually a sterile ring, which is a ring that is a cousin of a cholesterol ring, and it's a fat-soluble vitamin, and it's similar to, in a way to um, cholesterol. Now, when we talk about D2 and D3, D2 is called ergocalciferol, and ergocalciferol is a derivative of ergot, and it's a fungus. So once that fungus gets radiation to it, it starts making vitamin D2, and that's when we buy it at the supermarket and the, super st and the stores, and vitamin D2 mainly come in the fungus and is at the stores. So we do not make that vitamin D2. Whereas vitamin D3 is a vitamin that is originally related to cholecalciferol, and it starts with a ring that is made in the liver that moves to the skin. And on the skin, with the sun exposure, it is converted to 
7-dehydrocholesterol, and this molecule occurs naturally in the skin of humans, animals, and also in milk. Now, which one is more active, vitamin D2 or D3? And that's another myth question. Should I take vitamin D2 or D3? It's not really clear which one is more active and which one is more useful, but since we make vitamin D3, we humans, since animals make it, so I personally believe that vitamin D3 is a little bit more effective and more natural to take than vitamin D2. And then vitamin D is then transported in the form of calcidiol, and then it goes to the liver, and then it becomes 25-hydroxyvitamin D, then it goes to the kidneys, and then it becomes 125-dihydroxyvitamin D3. Now, why is this important? The reason it's important that anybody who has liver disease will end up with vitamin D deficiency. Anybody who has any form of kidney disease or dialysis or early kidney disease will have vitamin D deficiency. So it's fairly common as liver disease and kidney disease both are common. Now, what is the role of vitamin D in the human body? We used to think that vitamin D was only have to do with calcium and, and uh, hard or soft bones in children. And we think that milk and vitamin D is all what it was all about. We know today it is affecting cell growth, it affects immunity and the neural function, and it also affects inflammation. And you hear that term all the time, inflammation, um, also with the COVID and inflammation. So it also regulates inflammation, and it has a lot to do with gene regulation as well. There are 2,700 receptors in the human body that interact with vitamin D, and these genes are essential for the function of the body and for the body to do well. So what are the functions of vitamin D beyond the bones and the calcium and the uh, phosphorus and the height and the strength of the bones. Vitamin D affects hypertension, it affects cardiovascular disease, affects heart disease, and uh, chronic kidney disease. It also has a lot to do with obesity and diabetes and the term diabetes and has a lot to do with type 1 diabetes. It also has to do with fibromyalgia or osteomalacia. Remember, osteomalacia is a vitamin D deficiency. Fibromyalgia is not really very well understood. So these diseases can be confused by each other. So I prefer as a practicing physician, and if you are a patient who have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, ask about your vitamin D and ask what is my vitamin D level because correction of vitamin D may resolve your osteomalacia that can be misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia. It has a lot to do with psoriasis. It has a lot to do with immunity. Patients with multiple sclerosis, please make sure your vitamin D levels are adequate. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis, patients with COPD will have less frequency of bronchitis and COPD exacerbation spells as well. It has a lot to do with neuro and uh, brain function, and it has to do with asthma, with depression, the winter blues, the darkness blues that have to do with vitamin D deficiency. Also, it reduces the risk of breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and prostate cancer. And every cell in the human body has vitamin D receptors. So who is at risk for vitamin D deficiency? We know today that patients who are breastfed are at risk of vitamin D deficiency. Pregnant mothers are at risk of vitamin D deficiency. And also the elderly, as their metabolism and the synthesis and the making machines of vitamin D are now becoming old and not functioning as good. Also patients who are overweight, keep in mind, vitamin D is stored in the fat cells. So if you have a lot of fat cells, then vitamin D is taken out of the bloodstream and stored into the fat cells. So the vitamin D level in the blood is very low and you become vitamin D deficient and will have a lot of symptoms to do with it. Now, the other issue that is very essential is skin pigmentation. The skin pigmentation or the melanocytes have a tendency to prevent the ultraviolet light from touching the areas where vitamin D precursors are synthesized. So the darker you are, the slower you make vitamin D. And if you're not exposed to the sun for a long period of time, 
the darker you are, you are way more at risk of having vitamin D deficiency. So it is a myth that darker skin have, they are dark, so they must have enough vitamin D. It's actually the opposite. The darker you are, the more deficient you are because you cannot make any vitamin D of the sun. Chronic kidney disease and chronic liver disease, as I mentioned, uh, GI disease or a fat malabsorption can lead to vitamin D deficiency. Keep in mind also now as becoming more frequent, gastric bypass surgeries will lead to vitamin D deficiency. So about 50% also adolescent are vitamin D deficient. Now, if I have to summarize all this, almost everybody is at risk of vitamin D deficiency and almost everybody deserve to be evaluated for vitamin D deficiency. What are the symptoms of vitamin D deficiency? They are very nonspecific. Uh, they could be diabetes harder to control, central obesity, hypertension harder to control, um, aches and pains, knees, backs, um, depression, uh, CVA, chronic diseases, frequent COPD exacerbations, frequent infections, multiple sclerosis exacerbation spells that are more frequent than usual. So the symptoms are very nonspecific, but the most important symptom is actually chronic aches and pains in the bones and the muscles related to the periosteum inflammation related to the diagnosis of osteomalacia. So now, that brings us to the very important point, is this fibromyalgia or osteomalacia without a vitamin D level, without correction of vitamin D to the proper level? It is not fibromyalgia, it is osteomalacia until we fix vitamin D. Now, what are the effects of vitamin D on the cardiovascular system? Their very common effects have to do with the pathogenesis of cardiovascular disease, has to do with the protection of the kidneys, and has to do with reduction in left ventricular hypertrophy or the enlargement of the heart, which is a risk for sudden cardiac death. So vitamin D deficiency can lead to multiple cardiovascular events and diseases and that can be reversed with correction of vitamin D. Same with hypertension. Patients who have hypertension can have their disease easier to control when we correct their vitamin D, especially in postmenopausal women or the African American community. And it can reduce the need for the different antihypertensive agents. Now, there's a lot of debate about hypertension and vitamin D, but what I would say if you have vitamin D deficiency, stop the endless, meaningless debate about vitamin D and correct vitamin D, and then whatever hypertension you have, that's what you deal with. Another issue is insulin homeostasis. And keep in mind that insulin and vitamin D are very close and very interrelated. So patients who have diabetes are easier to control. It has a lot to do with central obesity, it has a lot to do with insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance, and it has to do a lot with this metabolic syndrome. Now, here's the issue. This is the American Diabetic Association talks about vitamin D and beta cell functions, which are the cells in the pancreas that regulate insulin production. Also has to do with abdominal obesity and has to do with insulin resistance from the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So the data about central obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and vitamin D deficiency are overwhelming without a shadow of a doubt. This is the American Academy of Neurology. And in this American Academy of Neurology, talk about vitamin D and the risk for dementia and Alzheimer's, and there's a substantial increased risk. So without a shadow of a doubt, elderly patients definitely need to be evaluated for vitamin D deficiency and replacement as needed. Now, we talked more about osteomalacia and fibromyalgias, and it's a periosteum inflammation and demineralization of the collagen. So they hurt, they swell, and keep in mind, it's mainly the sternum, the tibia, are the trigger points and the painful areas of the bone. So in fibromyalgia, we should check vitamin D, correct it, and if the pain is still there, then they have fibromyalgia. As the pain goes away, then they most likely had osteomalacia.
Now, lately we had the issue of COVID and vitamin D deficiency, and the data also continued to come and show that patients who had a lot of COVID complications in northern Spain, 80% of them had vitamin D deficiency. Now today you have the data is like an ocean about vitamin D and relationship with COVID. And you have a very, very large divided camps and conflicting data. But one solid fact, and that's a fact, that if somebody is vitamin D deficient, whether you are going to make a difference in COVID or not, but if they're deficient, they need to have that corrected for the 2,700 different functions that vitamin D has to improve their immunity, their blood pressure, their diabetes, and so forth. And if it helps with COVID, that would be great. This is a slide showing, if you look on the green slide, and I'm going to show you that patients who have mild disease, 95% of them had vitamin D levels above 30, and patients who ended up in the ICU with critical disease, the majority of them had vitamin D deficiency. Now, is this a causation or correlation? We really don't know, but this is an observational data that was published in April of 2020 at the beginning of COVID to show that there may be a serious relationship between vitamin D adequacy in the bloodstream and COVID complications. Now, the other issue we have seen also data talks about vitamin D relationship and uh, susceptibility to COVID and is there any correlation? And the answer has always been most likely yes. Same with cytokine storm, which has been the event that leads to the major need to be in the ICU on a respirator and critically ill. It's called the cytokine storm. Vitamin D deficiency downregulate this, make it milder and softer as well. What is my plan when you talk about vitamin D? In my practice, every patient should be screened for vitamin D. And Every patient should be screened at least annually for vitamin D, and we check the test called calcidiol, which is the barometer of the body stores of vitamin D. How do we treat? I treat a target level. So the dosages, if you talk about the Henry Ford protocol, 50,000 Q week, if you talk about the Mayo Clinic protocol, if you talk about the European uh, endocrinology society protocol, these protocols are different, but all of them want to achieve the safe goal, which is a level of 50 to 75, use 5,000 once a day, use 10,000 once a day, use 50,000 once a week, use 50,000 every two weeks, as long as your target, your eye is on the target where you want the level to be. Should I use D2 or D3? And the answer is, I really don't know. I personally prefer D3, which is the 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol, and we use the pill for vitamin D. Always take it with a fatty molecule like uh, olive oil, uh, peanut butter, a piece of uh, butter and toast, canola oil, avocado, but it has to be taken with the oily substance as it becomes a lot easier and a lot more valuable to absorb. We will never be able to stay in the sun for a long period of time to get adequate amount of vitamin D. So just being in the sun alone or somebody tells you, well, I'm living in the sun for um, you know one hour every day is definitely not enough. We always follow levels and we always treat accordingly as the levels dip. With this, I hope personally that I have made you aware enough about practical points about vitamin D. I did not show you any pathways, any mitochondrial subunits. I did not show you anything that is not useful in clinical practice, nor you, for you as a patient and as an educated patient want to help yourself about what should you do with your vitamin D. With this, stay healthy and stay safe. I am Dr. Rafai, the virtual nephrologist. Love.